Hi, now I'd like to welcome Dylan Knowles from Vendasta Technologies. Dylan will be speaking on future proofing of complex automation infrastructure at Vendasta. Dylan, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here. Awesome, hey everybody. Uh, yeah, so I guess let's kick this off. So my name is Dylan. I'm a senior developer and prescriptive analyst at Vendasta. What that basically means is when there is a really challenging analytics problem, I come in to uh, advise the business on, on what sort of decisions to make. And then outside of that, I end up helping build the infrastructure that makes a lot of the, the different parts of the platform possible. And oops, today, what we're going to be talking about is how Vendasta rolled out its automation system and what an automation system is. But before we get into that, uh, because most people here might not have heard of Vendasta, I want to give a, a quick overview of what we do as a company. The crux of the problem is that it's really hard for small and medium businesses to operate online. If you want to start selling something online or being a consulting service online, you need to manage your social media, you need to manage advertising, you need a sales pipeline, you need a marketing pipeline, you need a website. You may need a way to schedule meetings in an easy way and, and so on and so forth. And, and these things, they really don't scale very well if you're doing them as an individual. It gets very expensive. It's a lot to manage and you have to manage it in like 20 different places. So normally when businesses encounter this problem, they go to local experts like digital marketing agencies or tech companies to, to kind of help them bundle these things together. But at the same time, for those organizations, it doesn't scale either. They're just better at it. So Vendasta kind of cracked this nut and provides a platform where your it provides a, a platform where these local experts or the partners um, can actually get marketing tools, 250 plug and play products to sell. They can market their own products through there. There's outsourcing services uh, available through Vendasta. So build me a website and get it done in the next 48 hours. Um, won't make a guarantee on that timeline, but the team's fast. Uh, task tracking, invoicing, business training even for, for some of those small businesses as well as the local experts, uh, sales tools and the like. So some people will do this to serve tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of businesses. And other people will use this platform to specifically just get wholesale prices for everything from Google Workspace uh, to, to, to websites and whatnot for their own business. So if you're a consulting company, uh, this might actually be a really great way to get that holistic end-to-end -end journey for your customers uh, and actually make your online operations a lot more cost effective. And so as you might imagine, there's a huge amount of stuff that, that can happen here um, and so many different interacting pieces. Like for example, there's something called a snapshot where we take uh, an instant snapshot of uh, a company's profile online and figure out, can people find you? Can they talk to you? Are your reviews any good? Do you have a good social media presence? Can anybody, are your competitors out advertising you, for example? And when that's done, you know, you might want to communicate with a small business or reevaluate your own business and start different pipelines to, and tasks to, to deal with that. And that takes a lot of manual work. So what the organization did uh, was we created an automation system to glue all of those features together so people didn't actually have to, to manually do those pieces. And, and I was a, a part of that team kind of uh, assembling lots of pieces of that. Now, automation systems are important for any company that has a complex platform. I mean, you take a look at Trello, they, as simple as that looks, they actually introduced an automation system for you there. Um, there's if this, then that, I believe. There's Zapier that you can use. There's a lot of these systems out there because it's hard to glue stuff together. The problem with giving an automation system that much power though, is that they are immensely high risk because you have to first think about the adoption of this. You have to know how many people are going to do this and, and dramatically increase your computation load. Um, you also have to think about the profile of people that are using this. Is this your internal team that's making their life a little bit easier? Or is this like an external user that manages 100,000 businesses that wants to send an email campaign every single time one of those businesses does something uh, specific? And that makes a very big difference in terms of, of what you see on your, your backend system. 
And so you have to start thinking about questions like, what if I turn this thing on and it sends out a million emails at once and we blow up the capabilities of our email provider, like <laughs> one step down the road? Um, what if you, know, you activate for 100,000 people uh, a $10 or a $500 or a $5,000 feature in really quick succession? That's a lot of money that may be intentionally or accidentally spent, and you have to think about that. And what if an automation really causes companies problems? Uh, so something might go wrong. Somebody at the organization who may not have had uh, experience with the automation system may have done something that caused them to have a lot of egg on their face. These are, these are things you have to think through in advance. So uh, as you might imagine, since I'm at a simulation conference presenting simulation findings, we built a model to help us explore all of these different scenarios. And we, we kind of had to, to capture the gamut of this problem from how quickly are partners coming into our system? Are they finding the automation system? How quickly are they evaluating it and using it? What is that gonna do to our support team? When our support team can't answer a question, what's that gonna do to my team? Our internal teams, they, they use automations to implement new features as well. Uh, so we had to figure out what they were gonna do with it to make sure our infrastructure wasn't gonna blow up. And what that basically means is that we, rather than, uh, you know, they tell you not to boil the ocean. And uh, sometimes you just have to say, well, I have to boil the top millimeter across uh, across this thing just to make sure there's a little something for everyone. We, we built this thing in little modules to make sure we could get all of our stakeholders, that's 20 development teams, support team, sales team, uh, demand generation, our, our team. I think the only one we missed was actually fulfillment at the end of it, but they, were, they aren't uh, directly affected by this out of the gate. And so we, we captured everybody's needs as simply as we possibly could, but no simpler. Uh, one of the, the things that we also did is we, we really wanted to make sure we weren't relying on simpler models where we just assume linear uptake and, and linear growth in, in this system. Because uh, learning from the diffusion of innovations research, most product adoptions in a fixed uh, pool of customers has an S-curve. And if you don't have an S-curve, then you sort of have a beginning of an S-curve and then a, a nice incline at the top. So we had to think about how quickly were people going to take this up? What was that shape going to look like? And that was a really big part of this because we, we knew that people were going to have a learning curve and it was going to take some time to get up on top of this. We didn't want to think too carefully about individual partner attributes. So we wanted to, to, to disaggregate really carefully uh, because we had a really tight timeline to, to get this rolled out. And so we ended up splitting our simulation into what do our external partners do? What does our sales team do? And what does our R&D teams do? And that gave us a, a kind of a, a decent enough starting point where we had enough data that we could make some reasonable predictions from that. And uh, anybody in the, the, the research or the, the health space will, will know this term, but we lean on evidence synthesis. And that is a fancy way of saying that uh, the data is crap uh, in, in most things that we do in, in this world. And so at our organization, we collect a very large amount of data on what our platform is doing. And so sometimes we had you know, things right down to the fractional percent on the, on the data that we needed. And other times we just had to make expert judgments or reverse engineer the real values by pinning down a bunch of other parameters. So we're not a factory. We're not a, we're not a, a, a mining operation. We don't have all of those, those timings available to us easily. And especially because this is a new product that we were rolling out at the time. We had no idea how many people were going to uptake this. We had no idea what the user profile was going to look like. We had guesses, but we uh, and, and some some qualitative research, but that's as far as we had. So we really had to, to, to step into this and just dive into the deep end and hope we could swim. So the, the, this model had, a, like I noted, had a, a few main components, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a quick walkthrough of it. And uh, since we're all here, I assume everybody has seen system dynamics, and so there's no sense showing you my spaghetti diagrams. Uh, I'll give you the, the, the high level overview of this and, and we'll, we'll get into the result as we go. So first we tried to capture partner adoption and retention. The idea is that we have those local experts coming into the platform, they get a first impression either through our sales team or self-exploration. 
A bunch of them are lost because that's just naturally what happens when you have a SaaS platform. People try it and they go, oh, maybe not for me or for me. And then we kind of break it down into really good fit partners who the platform just clicks for them and it's exactly what they need. Then there's sort of our poor fit partners who come to it and they go, well, this doesn't quite work for me because there's a lot of manual pieces. And then automation can stitch it together and really get them what they want. So we wanted to see if we have automation in there, can we actually make those poor fit partners switch over to be good fit partners? And if so, what is that going to do to our revenue long term? We then needed to think about, OK, those poor fit and good fit partners, um, are they going to try automations? Because we, we've got some serious power users uh, for, from big names uh, <laughs> on our platform. And uh, we knew that once they started playing with this, they were going to go, oh my gosh, we can we can really get this thing moving. And, and some of them really did. So we had to, to think about both the people who were stocked up knowing that automations were coming, excited about it, sort of our test, trusted testers trying this out, as well as these people who are kind of coming into the platform and exploring around and going, oh, hey, this might be super useful. And we knew that at some point, you know, people would, would try it and, and maybe decide to, to not use it going forward because automations aren't for everyone. Once those automations were actually created, then they had to be turned on. And eventually they might be turned off. And we had sort of an idea, uh, we had to get an idea of once they were on and running, what sort of uh, infrastructure load was that going to do? And then once the automations were up and running and people were going, hey, this isn't doing quite what I think it should be doing. Then we had to go to sale, uh, sorry, support team and figure out, you know, are there tiers like tier one support, tier two support actually equipped to deal with this? And then if they're not equipped to deal with it, uh, how many of those requests are going to come to our team? And how much time and energy are we going to have to, to, to put into supporting them? Uh, because, you know, if we've got one of our partners that has hundreds of thousands of small businesses that they work with uh, and something is going wrong, then obviously we uh, drop everything and help them out. And then we also looked at uh, sales. You know, how much toil could we avoid through uh, using automations? And same thing for, with R&D. If our R&D teams are using automations to implement features, uh, how much infrastructure load is that going to provide and how much time are we saving them? The results here I can give you, the, the first one is quantitative findings. What we focused on for the, the real, like the real meat of the quantitative findings were we wanted to understand how many partners were going to use this, how many automations they were going to make so we could actually judge our success. You know, did people actually, actually like this feature? And we wanted to know how many would be running because that's what, where the infrastructure load comes from. And so we explored a variety of good fit partner adoption and poor fit partner adoption with uh, with the middle of that band being our best calibrated scenario. And we, we calibrated only on the first two weeks of data out of the gate and then tried to make a, a quarter prediction. And then me in the background, I tried to make year long predictions to see sort of what that would look like over time. We did reasonably well for about the first six months. And... The uptake on this and the usage was actually pretty much where we expected. You'll see that the partner is using or trialing is a little bit off the center, and I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. The awesome thing is that the automation's running. Uh, we were off. We had no historical data to go on whatsoever, and we were our prediction was off by like three percent, which I you know con confetti in the background. <laughs> I just wanted to. We're all we're all working remote. I just wanted to grab somebody by the collar and go. It's like, have you seen this? This is fantastic. Same thing with automations created. We were only about 4% off that, which was awesome, 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 exactly what we wanted. The number of automation users, so our, our local experts, our partners using this, we were about 20% off at the gate. But thankfully, because uh, I you know sometimes make mistakes, um, I, <laughs> I accidentally screwed up a query. And uh, I, I realized that um, I didn't time bound one side of the queries. And so I, I, I went back and I took a look at it. And actually, some of our partners that tried it out and, and didn't use it for a month actually came back uh, after a couple of months and became active users again. So if I look at that cohort that first started using this during that period, we're only 3% off of that number. It's just our definition of active user was a little too tight. So read into those numbers how you will uh, as to how far we were off. But at most, it was only 20%, which is fantastic. Like a lot of modeling efforts, 
that involve a lot of stakeholders and teams, the qualitative findings can be as important as the quantitative ones, as I'm sure a lot of people here know. And for those of you in a business environment uh, who are who are trying to do this, this is this is not something to be underestimated. So one of the things that we realized about automations was that we, we went into it thinking that we were just going to save our r d teams time we're a sprint-based environment uh teams they they want to kind of go at a similar cadence every every couple of weeks and they they, they don't want to put a, too much effort into to some they don't want to put an overly large amount of effort into things if they don't have to so we thought they'd come to us we could we could simplify their work by 90 percent as it turns out a lot of teams get a lot of requests from partners that are really awesome requests, but might take like three months of six people working at it to get it to work. Whereas with automations, because most of the infrastructure is there, they would then need to only spend one week to implement the feature that they like that the, the part of the automation that they would actually need to do. So for example, um, I started, I was really interested in machine learning to see if we could predict uh, subscription upgrades. And doing that by itself, creating a microservice to make that work, doing all the, the research and the like, that, that's a huge amount of effort to, to put up the infrastructure for that. But with the right filters and automations, all I had to do was come up with a threshold that would trigger a yes, no decision to investigate that partner more in depth. <laughs> and so, I mean, like, even as, even as somebody who built this, I didn't really realize that that would be the value of this for our R&D teams. And so that really shifted the way we think about this. And it created something called built-in automations which now R and D teams can can build features in, and, and it's just kind of awesome to see. Um, we also realized that even if automations don't strictly save a huge amount of time or money in the long run, they can actually just make our staff happier, and quality of life improvements is really good. So, for example, our sales team. Uh, has a lot of daily toil where they have to check on duplicates or they have to, to triage certain things. And what we can do is um, what we can do there is actually just remove some toil for them. And that just makes everybody happier, even if it doesn't have a, a huge quantitative effect, um, or at least not you know, in terms of time saved. So what we got wrong here, because there there's everybody gives their happiest version of their presentation without going into the lessons they may have learned. And so I, I, I feel like to be completely honest about this and to get maximize everyone else's learning, you should learn from our example. So the first thing we, we didn't do is, and I mean, looking back, it's super obvious, but adoption of a feature is not the same as mastery of the feature. We assumed that out of the gate, we'd start to get a lot of support tickets where people were exploring this pretty aggressively. Um, as it turns out, people explored it really aggressively, took a couple of months, even up to half a year to get good at it, and then started sending us some really big ticket support tickets. Um, so we, we actually uh, could have put that delay in there. As well, we, we thought about revenue in terms of subscriptions, uh, but what it actually turns out to be is that since Vendasta takes uh, a small cut like any app store out of uh, activations that go on of, our, of uh, those 250 plug and play products that we offer at wholesale costs, um, we actually could have better evaluated the cost benefits of this by taking a look at those sort of second order revenue pieces. We also, because we were using system dynamics, didn't quite get to see uh, the noisy neighbor effect in those models. And uh, as we, as it turns out, we had power users that occasionally uh, would blow the number so high that it didn't even make sense to have them on any of our charts. Um, and we have since, uh, let's say, reinforced our infrastructure to address those sudden load spikes. The recap here, because I see I have a minute left, is we built a, a model with a, a little bit of something for everyone. And we, we really used it to explore sort of what if analyses and, and manage our risk of this really like high octane system that we were putting in there. And we did that without even having historical data. And we came, came so super close to the right answer. It was just fantastic. Um, we also learned really well to support our support teams. This was sort of my favorite lesson coming out of this. Um, we realized this was gonna be something that came to support a lot, which we normally wouldn't think about as, as backend developers. And we wrote huge documentation specifically tailored to their needs. And I, I think we, we couldn't have made them any happier as a result. So I think we set kind of a new, 
a new norm within the team to, to help them out. And they, they seem to love that relationship now. Uh, and as well, be, beware of outliers. You know, there's always the 80-20 rule uh, about where uh, problems will come from, but also be aware in the the, the words of, of Joachim Sternberg that 80-20 nests. So that 20% is going to have an 80-20 and that 20% is going to have an 80-20 and that will eventually get you down to a handful of people or things that will cost you a lot in terms of time or money or effort or infrastructure. So even if you're using system dynamics, think about that particular di dimension as well. And that's it. Bang on 20 minutes. Do we have any questions? I will stop sharing my screen and, and go take a look. Any questions? No user questions yet. Hmm. Let me think. Can I generate one of my own questions and, and ask uh, on, on the fly here? So one of the things that made this particularly challenging as well was kind of thinking about all of our all of our data sources. Um, and I know this is always a problem in, in models where people have lots and lots of data points that they have to deal with. A common approach I've seen is people make up a giant spreadsheet of, of values and then have stakeholders input, you know, 50, 100 values, and then have to write their own library for like importing this spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet format is super fragile. And then what happens if you have calculated stuff in there, right? And then you have to worry about references and making sure that all of everybody agrees with the references and where they came from. Um, we used a, a specific Java library for that. And so for every one of our parameters that wasn't overridden by a simulation experiment, we actually uh, could say, this is the value, this is where it came from, is it a placeholder or not? And we actually have a, a full bibliography table that we can dump out to file every single time this thing runs. And it makes it, makes it so much more manageable. Uh, and it can even go into a markdown file that goes into our repo every single time we, we upload something to the cloud. So if anybody is interested in such a system, uh, this was actually an open source thing I developed uh, ages ago, and we just kind of refined it a little bit during this project. It, it makes dealing with data so much simpler um, and, and makes it easier to communicate to your stakeholders what your assumptions are. How long was the uh, next question is, how long was development from inception to proof of concept to production? We, if memory serves, um, we started on this kind of at the end of December, early January. And most of that ended up just being interviews for a few weeks. Then it was about two weeks of model construction and getting the data. And then about two weeks of kind of refinements and calibrations as the, the first set of data rolled in. Our, our first calibration was pretty pessimistic and we kind of missed things like, oh, what if there's a marketing blitz from our from our uh, marketing team? Because that kind of has a stepwise increase in the, in the number of people adopting this. And so that's roughly what we're looking at. I think it was about six weeks to two months that we were playing with this start to finish. Um, and for, for a team, to have to interact with that many teams, I, I feel like we were moving at a pretty breakneck speed. This was in addition to actually building the feature itself, uh, wrapping it up. Question two is, are you maintaining the model now and updating it as you observe new behavior? What your model future for you and your org? So funny you ask that. Uh, one of the cool things that we've decided on is uh, that this was like such a success that there's been kind of ongoing talks about how do we do this going forward? And recently, because you know the R and D team, we we do sort of requests for comments and, and other uh, documents like that. I put something together and I said, "What if we just make a model of this entire business, start to finish?" Because we already have a lot of those pieces sitting there. And um, without going into too much detail on on that, uh, we we found a good place to start with another chunk. We're going to try and modularize the automations one a little bit more and kind of correct some of our uh, missing pieces. And what it means is, you know, we might have a model for lead generation, we might have a model for support, we might have a model for automations, and then we can link them together, uh, as, as Cindy said, by having those models have kind of dependencies on each other. Um, the, excuse me, the organization is really used to, to microservice architecture. We, we kind of follow best practices um, from, from modern engineering organizations. And so that, that's going to be pretty par for the course for us. 
the hope is that that will uh, take off reasonably shortly and we continue to build it. So uh, any, logic, uh, any logic staff and, and, uh, and providers, if you're listening, uh, we might be coming and talking to you about cloud stuff in the near future, if we're lucky. Five minutes left. All right, from Wade McDonald, was, a, was this a user-facing model within the organization or was it just to inform your advice to colleagues? Uh, what we did was we we ran the model kind of behind the scenes. We we vetted it with our product marketers and uh, product managers, and we basically said, you know, this is the most recent prediction. This is why we think it's happening. Uh, they would ask any obvious questions if if something drastic looked wrong with the calibration, uh, and then we we have a, an internal communication channel where we just. Every single day, we said, this is how we're tracking against prediction. This is where we are on the line. This is what's going on here. And we had a lot of excitement for that. Uh, and then once we hit our first quarter, we said, this is, you know, we're 3% off. Awesome stuff, people. We kind of were at a steady state with automations. And the team just kind of let it ran from there. Uh, people, one of, the, one of the artifacts that came out of this that I didn't mention was in order to get this data in a lot of places and to like actually make sure we were calibrating against something, we had to create a series of dashboards and we need to create stuff in, in Data Studio and, and kind of get all those queries there. So there was a full on automations dashboard for monitoring the feature in a way that we hadn't done as an organization. Re well, I mean, I guess lots of teams had done it, but this was, this was a pretty big one to do it on. And that's evolved over time. And so that's more of the maintained uh, feature coming out of this. But the automations model particularly is going to be brought back up and become a little more user facing as, uh, as time goes on. Or that's, that's my hope anyway. I hope that answered everybody's questions. Is there, uh, is there anything else before, I, before this gets handed back to, to David Kirby? All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thanks for the questions. And if you have anything else for me, come contact me in the platform or come find me on LinkedIn. That's Dylan Knowles. All right. See everyone. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh